Good morning and welcome to the AZ Bio Expo. We are so excited to have all of you with us today. About a year ago, as we were getting ready for an election cycle, there was a lot of talk about clinical trials. And one of the things that we realized is that outside of our small group, there was so much misunderstanding on what clinical trials really are. And also a tremendous lack of knowledge on the amount of clinical trials that are actually being done right here in Arizona. So what you're going to experience today is the result of those discussions. Now, we all come from different places, and we all have different levels of experience. So one of the things that I did is I thought, you know, we really need a baseline. We need someone who can set the stage for the day and really give us all a shared understanding of what clinical trials are. And so I went to the source and said, Dr. Slater, would you help me out? And of course, he always says yes when we ask for his help. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Mark Slater from Honor Health. Well, thanks, Joan. And wow, what a, what a great meeting. As a member of the Arizona Biosciences uh, Roadmap Steering Committee, uh, I'm so excited to see a vibrant biosciences community developing here in Arizona. And really appreciate Joan and her team for all that you've done to support uh, this development, this coming together of the community, and particularly this terrific meeting. So, as you heard, Joan has asked me to provide a brief introduction to the clinical trials process. So I'm, it's going to be a very simple talk. I really just want to accomplish three things. Uh, one, I want to tell you a little bit about who I represent here, because uh, we all work in teams. Uh, two, we'll provide a, a framework for the clinical trials process. And uh, three, I want to emphasize the patient experience in the clinical trials because they really are central to everything that we do and everything that we're trying to do. So I came to the Phoenix metropolitan area eight years ago from University of California, San Diego, where I've been on the faculty since 1987. And I came to develop a clinical uh, research institute at Scottsdale Healthcare in partnership with TGen. And as of this year, we are now known as Honor Health. Uh, late breaking news of the merger between Scottsdale Healthcare and John C. Lincoln. So you can see uh, a little bit about the kinds of services that we offer, the scale, uh, now one of the largest healthcare systems and uh, employers in, in the state. Located not only in the five hospitals, but 74 uh, facilities across the Phoenix uh, uh, metropolitan area and providing care to about a, a community of about 1.6 million uh, people in the metro area. In 2005, we established a clinical research institute. It was begun with local philanthropy from the uh, Piper Charitable Trust and the Bisgo Stardust Foundation. Our focus was solely on clinical and translational research rather than basic research with a goal of being a, uh, a niche player that would be an enabler for all the great bio, uh, basic science that was being done in the universities and in the community. Our primary scientific partner was TGen, but we developed collaborations with the ASU and University of Arizona, major universities, companies, uh, hospitals, and institutes around the area and, and nationally. In terms of scale, we have about 200 active clinical trials ranging across major uh, clinical areas, but we're best known for our work in cancer and the development of new drugs under the leadership of Dan Von Hoff, our chief scientific officer, and a real treasure in our community, one of the leading 
uh, new cancer uh, drug developers in the country uh, and uh, a spark plug for innovation uh, locally and nationally. This is where we're located. We're at 92nd and Shea on the Shea Medical Center uh, campus. Uh, we're uh, the building on, on my left there, uh, which is uh, adjacent to our Virginia G. Piper Cancer Center and connected with the uh, covered walkway, which we like to think of as the bridge between cure and care to emphasize that bedside to bench to bedside development of new innovations, getting those into patient care, having patient care inform science in an integrated uh, system. We think of ourselves as an institute without walls. We certainly do not have all the answers or the ability to, uh, to uh, provide all of the work that is needed to be done, but the uh, great innovations come through collaboration and we've been fortunate to collaborate with leading institutions locally, nationally, and internationally. These are just a few of those. But again, locally with a T not only Tijin, but University of Arizona, ASU, also uh, our hospitals and our uh, great local companies like Celgene and Ventana, uh, as well as some of our new niche players like our development of imaging endpoints and imaging core lab uh, locally that uh, is working. But through uh, collaboration and teamwork, which is developing in this community, we can all have a much bigger imprint uh, on the health and well-being of our community, as well as the development of new innovations uh, for the field in general. So what do we do? The clinical trials process is deceptively simple. We look at this and we say, well, you, you come up with an idea and you write out a protocol or a plan for what is to be done. You collect or gather a team that is working on that. Go find some patients to run through the protocol, collect and enter data, analyze the data, present the results, and submit it to the regulatory bodies. Simple, right? We all know the devil's in the details and the process behind any of these research having the real impact on the development of new products and services is much more complicated. So the FDA recognizes a series of phases in the development of new products. And this is a traditional process which begins with preclinical research. This may be animal or laboratory research, but is really looking at fundamental concepts an understanding of where the potentials for development might be. Once an innovation is then brought forward for potential study, we move into the phases of clinical development. The first phase is a very small scale, uh, kind of a pilot testing or phase one, typically small numbers of patients, 15 to 30 patients. If we continue to be promising, we move on to slightly larger scale studies, which might involve 100 patients, uh, sometimes a little more, a little less. If we continue to be promising into larger scale phase three, which are in the hundreds or thousands of, st of patients, finally then the collective body of information is reviewed by the FDA for approval. After an approval, there's what we call phase four, or post-market studies, continuing to look at the safety of the new innovations continuing to, to uh, uh, develop them further. So the emphasis of each of these stages is, is uh, uh, presented in this chart. Phase one is the beginnings of checking for safety and determining the dose for new uh, uh, medications for the administration of, of, of devices or procedures. Stage two, or phase two then, is where we start to really emphasize the look on efficacy. Does this work? Are we getting the impact that we would expect on the markers of, of a clinical improvement that we would expect? Phase three is bringing it out to a larger population to confirm those findings, to determine what the side effect profiles are. And then in phase four, we're looking for additional side effects long-term safety, parameters that might uh, impact different kinds of patient response after the drug is on the market. 
That traditional cycle, though, it doesn't it kind of give you the flavor for the cost and the time involved. In this chart, it gives a bit of a sense of that. It typically takes 15 years to develop a new drug through this, this cycle of approvals at the cost of about $1 billion. So we may start with somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 potential ideas or potential compounds in the preclinical space. Those get winnowed down to maybe 250, somewhere on that neighborhood that are showing potential. Um, out of that 250, only five will go forward into the clinical development or clinical trial space. You'll see that as you go through the phases and the increasing scale, there's increasing dollars in commitment to the testing. And only one of those drugs will make it through there to FDA approval. Again, a very uh, time intensive and costly endeavor. But this kind of old school distinct phases, uh, I think, uh, doesn't give the best picture for what really happens. In reality, we have a very dynamic, fluid, and overlapping process. As you can see in this chart with the phases overlapping, sometimes feedback loops and moving between them uh, in order to get through to the, to the other side. And I think with some of the new innovations that have been developed in our valley, we're seeing changes to the process in general. One of those changes is the recognition in the FDA of what's called the crit critical paths. And our work locally with Ray Woosley and company, the Critical Path Institute has been uh, instrumental in impacting that process. But really looking at the dimensions of the approval process of safety, medical utility or the impact of the innovation, and then the commercialization uh, uh, or mass production of, of the process gathering data across a process that moves from basic science to clinical development and ultimately into launch. Another key innovation that's having a big impact is the development of biomarkers. And you see on the left hand side here the, develop the drug development process that I've just listed for you and on the right hand side a parallel process for the development of biomarkers and biomarker assays. As our science is developing, particularly in the area of, of uh, molecular medicine, we're identifying the importance of biomarkers and understanding the disease process, targets for intervention, and then targets to determine whether we're getting the clinical response that we want. These processes are parallel, and we're now seeing these areas really married up so that there are companion biomarkers with the new therapies in uh, packages that are having a dramatic impact on care. All right, that's the general framework we're talking about, but I think we can better understand this by walking through the patient, walking through what the clinical course looks like, because when it comes down to it, we're all here to develop new innovations because patients need them, and it's a patient need and patient demand that puts us in this place. So a key, a key marker for us uh, happened with this fellow. This is Jerry. He's a Scottsdale resident who is a 68-year-old man with a history of basal cell cancers dating back to the 1980s. By the 90s, he'd had a resection of his lung. So basal cell common skin cancer, for most people who remove the lesion, they do just fine. In a small number of these cases become metastatic. They spread, they go to uh, vital organs, fatal disease. At this time, there were no effective treatments for this. You could just continue to resect away tumor, try to make patients comfortable, and uh, that was the best that could be done. By 2005, he had metastases to his spine, to his lungs, had terrible pain. So he was oxygen dependent. He was in, in terrible pain, uh, he was not ambulatory, and was sent to hospice with a life expectancy of a few weeks. What do we do? What do we do for a patient like this that has an increasingly poor course, 
there are no good therapies available. Well, if you look at the literature at that time, this is the experience, a New England Journal article, uh, looking at phase one or first in human studies in cancer in the 1990s. And you found that only 4% of patients that went on these phase one studies showed any kind of clinical benefit. So these studies were primarily looking at dose and safety and not having a clinical benefit for patients. That old school mentality was we took large heterogeneous uh, baskets of patients, threw the next drug at them that was developed, see what sticks. Does anybody get any better? And you could see not very many people got better. There must be a better way. And we think through the development of um, a better understanding of the science and the molecular biology underlying tumors and cancer, we can develop targeted therapies that could have a, a bigger impact. This was the promise of the Human Genome Project and the promise that was developed here in the Phoenix area and in Arizona. To, so to accomplish this or to be able to do these kinds of studies uh, and, and have the kind of impact we want, we recognize this has to be a team effort. This is an initial team that was working on that. In the upper left-hand corner is our clinical research team uh, at, uh, at that time Scottsdale Healthcare, and then our basic science research team at TGen. So we have the opportunity in Arizona of putting together the basic science teams, preclinical teams like the group at TD2, and clinical research teams like the one at Scottsdale Healthcare. And when we looked at the science, we start at the preclinical level. So our story begins in the 1950s with observations from shepherds in Idaho where they saw a disturbing trend of birth defects in baby lambs that were being born. And some of them were being born cyclopic or with only one eye and they determined that the mothers were grazing on an indigenous plant called the western corn lily and that plant had a chemical compound makeup that blocked the normal development of the eye in the uh, lamb in utero. Basic science research identified that pathway, that key signaling pathway is called the hedgehog pathway. And in the 1990s, this pathway was identified or implicated in the development of several cancers, including basal cell cancers, prostate, lung, and pancreatic cancer. So this pathway should be activated in development in utero, and then it should be shut off. But when it's reactivated in adulthood, we see the, the risks increasing for cancer. So we found then this, this naturally occurring substance, which was the chemical compound was identified and called cyclopamine. It targeted the protein smoothened through the hedgehog pathway, and that that uh, compound had no effect on the adult sheep, but it did affect just the, the, the embryo in development. That gave us a clue for a druggable pathway or the potential for drugging this pathway, which is awry. So what do we do with Jerry? So we see Jerry's scans on the left with the cancers in his lungs, spine, and liver. We take this compound, which is developed into an oral agent, so it's not a toxic chemotherapy, but, just an, but an oral pill that is directly targeted to that pathway. The first human to receive this drug. We go through a full informed consent where he understands his treatment options, the risks and benefits, and decides he wants to participate in the development of this new treatment. After eight months, you see his scan on the right-hand side with the significant improvement on the reduction of his cancers in his lungs and uh, uh, liver as well as, as bone. This is Dr. Von Hoff doing a neuro exam with Jerry. And I just wanted to mention that the sponsor of this drug was ready to give up on the drug. They developed this drug for a general cancer therapy in their early trials or their early uh, investigations, it was not effective. It was only beginning to see that it could be effective in a very targeted population where the science matched up with the compound. This is Jerry. The patient's perspective was, wow, this works. He went from hospice 
to independent living, off the oxygen, off the pain medicines, back to exercising, dancing, and full quality of life with an oral agent, a pill that was developed. Next person, 48-year-old with a, uh, a lesion in his lungs. You can see on the left-hand side the little round circles. By two months, lesion's gone. The, can the tumor's gone. 84-year-old in the auditory canal, it's circled. The tumor, after two months, tumor's gone. 83-year-old in the ear and parotid gland, you can see that the tumor's coming out in this basal cells on the outside. After two months, normal skin and healing. 49-year-old with a massive lesion in his back, starting to heal and granulate with normal skin after three months. So eight of the first nine patients in the first in human studies showed these kinds of benefits. The lasting impact of that at this point in the early study, they was, were 137 days to 480 days and counting. So it was uh, having min minimal side effects and lasting effects showed us that we were on the right track, that this approach to precision medicine of using the basic science to target therapies had real and true potential, and we could move on to confirmatory studies. This study then was published in the New England Journal. It, uh, Dr. Von Hoff was selected for the ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncology Plenary uh, talk as the leading uh, cancer innovation of, of, of that year. Uh, and uh, uh, the drug now is known as Vismatajeb. It was approved by the FDA after only five years rather than that 15-year development. These are a couple of our clinical research nurses and, and nurse managers with one of the uh, initial patients on that first in human study. Those, those um, test pilots who were willing to go on trial. By the way, um, there's some evidence that patients on clinical trials actually do better than patients in standard care. And we think there might be two reasons for that. One is on trial we have such careful monitoring and the ability to act on any complications, side effects that we see. They get much more intensive care than what is typical in, uh, typically available in routine care. And the second is this, we think is the sense of purpose and social support that's gathered by being a team and moving out. Most patients that go on clinical trial, they of course hope it will benefit them, but their primary motivation is altruistic, wanting others to not suffer what they've gone through, wanting to learn, have treatments that can benefit their family, their friends, their community, and people in the future. So we see through this process of tightening um, the link between basic science and clinical science of targeting therapies that we can accelerate innovation and accelerate through the regulatory path. This is my favorite slide. This is an 87-year-old uh, patient who had a complete response, which means that there was no detectable cancer following treatment. He decided to celebrate by, uh, by going uh, a parachuting, <laughs> starting his new life. So although phase one therapies were initially thought of as just looking at safety and dosing, you can see now we can move towards clinical intent toward having impact on a, a good number of patients, if not the majority of patients, and it can be life-changing. This is a patient from a combination therapy study that we're doing in pancreas cancer with one of our local companies at Celgene. This patient has stage four pancreas cancer, again, given a life expectancy of a few months. This is him at a one-year anniversary after going on a new combination therapy where he has had a complete response, and at this point we don't see any active cancer. These interventions can be life-altering, even in diseases as challenging as pancreas cancer, where we're seeing now patients that are at five and ten years in survival, and we're trying to work our way up earlier in the scheme. So what are the lessons learned? Lessons learned for our community is first, if you build it, they will come. Developing clinical trials brings patients, brings business opportunities into our community. Just at our institution, we've had patients from 48 states 
and two dozen countries that have come here for care on these trials. My favorite story is a, a patient that came from Palo Alto. He had a pretty good institution down the street from him. He came here 62 times over a five-year period to get a treatment because it was a first in human, not available anyplace else, has had a complete remission, doing quite well. This is an opportunity for our community. Second thing I want to emphasize, it's not all about the scientists, it's not all about the doctors, but a big part of what we do is in the paperwork, is in the regulatory framework. This is some of our crack staff in reminding us that we, it's not over until you get the paperwork done. Uh, our regulatory people, our human subjects and ethics people, our contracting, our nurses, our laboratorians, our technicians are all critical for getting the work done. And as we grow as, as an institution, as we grow as a community, I think the other thing we have to remember is no matter how big we get, our key success factor is being nimble. We're all about innovation. This is a fast-moving field. Um, one of the main reasons that you got a, a surfer from California came to the desert was because of the opportunity to, have, to create innovations and to move quickly. The major action is not going to be in large bureaucratic institutions. It's going to be at companies and individuals and institutions that are willing to work together and collaborate at the cutting edge to move forward. And in Arizona, we have the opportunity to do that with our collaborative groups. And finally, I don't think we should ever forget why we are here, why we do research, why we build companies, why we develop innovations. It's because of our patients, patients that are suffering from illnesses that cannot wait for innovations. The status quo is simply unacceptable. Here's one of my motivations. The little girl sitting there was my daughter. This was following one of her uh, piano recital. And the lady at the top left with the roses was her piano teacher and then her piano teacher's daughter. Within a year of this picture being taken, the, her piano teacher died from pancreas cancer. She was identified and, and, and died within three months of diagnosis. So we need to have better early detection, better treatments and answers, so her daughter is not, not saddled uh, with, the same, uh, with this legacy. My daughter, within a year of this, developed um, an, an unusual and, and, and chronic and poorly understood disease that's, that's left her quite disabled for the past five years and a very challenging period in her life. And we're still exploring for the answers and for the innovations. And what I understand from this is what we do out here and what we do together is essential. It's essential for patients, for their families, and, our, for, and for our communities. It brings jobs, it brings business, it brings opportunity, but most of all, it brings hope and it brings better quality of life. And so we must do all we can do individually and collectively to get there. I hope this has been helpful in giving you a brief introduction and a little bit of a framework to understand what our patients go through and what, what our, our process is. And it really is just the springboard for a very exciting day of great work that's being done across our community by leading experts, leading institutions, and uh, I'm very excited to hear from them today. Thank you very much. I'll get you